Uh, so I'm going to be talking about verification techniques in Ruby and asking the question, could a machine ever write tests for our code? So to start, I want to ask you guys a question. So looking at this picture, can you tell if this is a sunrise or a sunset? Think about that to yourself. We're going to come back to that when we later on in this talk. So my name is Lauren Siegel. I've been working on a master's in formal verification research at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. It's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I also wrote a documentation tool called Yard. I don't know if you guys, you guys have heard about it. Um, we will be using it in the talk. The tool actually uses it, so we'll, we'll be looking at that. I'm also on GitHub and Twitter, so if you want to talk to me after the talk, chat with me. Check out my code. It's all there. So I developed a tool called RubyCorrect, and I should preface this entire talk with the fact that this is a real proof of concept. It's not really production ready. Um, but the tool set has uh, two tools inside of it for program verification in Ruby. The first tool is called Ruby ESC, which does extended static checking. And the second one is called Ruby Kstone, which does symbolic execution. And uh, we'll talk about those to understand what extended static checking and symbolic execution are, we need to understand what, how formal verification works on the general basis of formal verification. The problem here is that formal verification is boring. There are a lot of details, uh, but we will have to be skipping most of them, but not all of them. So with that, what is formal verification? Formal verification is basically a set of methodologies using logic and theorem proofs to verify program correctness. In other words, we use math or Boolean algebra to verify that your program does what you wanted it to. Uh, some of the methodologies include extended static checking, which we'll be looking at, symbolic execution, which we'll be looking at. There are other ones like model checking, runtime checking, and others. Uh, to give a brief landscape of what the spectrum looks like, so there's a stat we have static verification, we have runtime verification. Um, the two ones that we, be we will be looking at today are ESC and symbolic execution. ESC is very much a static verification kind of concept. Symbolic execution actually sits between static and runtime checking, and we'll talk about how those two interplay with each other with ESC and symbolic execution, what, what the similarities and differences are with those two. So let's start with ESC. ESC is, is extended static checking. As I just pointed out, it's static verification for code. What we do is we, we translate a method into a single logical expression. So think Boolean algebra. Um, we can confirm that that method is correct, assuming a given precondition that our postcondition matches, matches the logical steps in that method. Or in other words, Given a set of logical preconditions, when I execute a method, the result should be equivalent, equivalent to my postcondition. So preconditions and postconditions, um, as I mentioned, they're pretty much logical expressions in the form of Boolean algebra. Uh, P implies Q and R, stuff like that. We assume that the precondition is correct, and this is how we typically use pre and postconditions. We assume that the precondition is correct. And assuming that the precondition is, is, is valid, we assert that the postcondition will uh, equal, be equivalent to what, our, what we set our method should be. So for an example of that, this is the Fibonacci sequence, we can write this as pre and postconditions, and we can have a precondition for Fibonacci, uh, Fib and N, saying that N is greater or equal to zero. Uh, we can also have two postconditions. The first postcondition says that our result is going to be n if n is less than 2. And we have a second postcondition that says our result will be fib of n minus 1 plus fib of n minus 2 if n is greater or equal to 2. And that, those are our pre and postcondition. In other words, what we're really doing is we're doing design by contract. I talk about contracts a lot when I talk about Yard. Um, the reason I like contracts is that contracts are effectively specifications. And specifications are effectively documentation. So I like documentation a lot, um, and this is typically how you would mark up in Yard a specification for our Ruby ESC tool. 
you can see the pre and post conditions are specified in pretty much a similar syntax over there, and as well as the type annotations to tell it that we're using the numbers. Um, so the good thing about writing this out in documentation is that I also talk about this a lot, auditing code. And I've, I've talked about this in a bunch of yard talks that I've given in the past. Um, I've always wanted a tool that can read documentation and verify its correctness. Mm -hmm. And so I actually got to be, to be able to build that tool with Ruby ESC. So I'm just going to jump into a quick little demo here. Um, I'm going to pop up this Fibonacci code right here. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty much the same code that we just saw in the slide. We can actually execute this through our Ruby ESC tool. So we can go uh, and run it through the tool. And so it's going to tell us that you know it's right. But we can go in and make a change and break it and see what happens. So we'll do fib of n minus 3 instead of fib of n minus 2. That should break it. And let's see what happens. So it's, oh, okay. there we go. And so it's running through, and it's going to. I did not press enter, there we go. Let me try it again. All right, so um, this time it had four errors. One of them is that we violated a precondition. So this is something uh, I didn't actually notice when I first made this change, but when you actually set fib of n minus 3, you're actually violating the post condition when n equals 2. So when n equals 2, you're actually passing fib of negative 1, which violates the precondition. So we violated our precondition. We've also violated the post condition, but that's a little more obvious. We're not implementing Fibonacci sequence as specified. So that's Ruby ESC in general. And that's sort of how it works. Uh, that's, that's what it is, basically. But how does it work? That's the question. Um, so what we do for Ruby ESC is we take Ruby code, and we translate it into a language called Boogie. And then Boogie takes that code and translates it translates it to a for a theorem prover to parse and uh, perform the real heavy lifting. So let's go through these steps one by one and figure out what each one is. First we have Ruby. Well, we all know what Ruby is, so let's move on. Um, Boogie. Boogie is an intermediate verification language. It's also a tool by the same name, so you can run Boogie code using the Boogie language. Uh, it's a Microsoft research project. Probably one of the only Microsoft projects I like. Um, you can try it out actually right now if you are bored in the top. You can go to wisefromcom boogie and you can actually type in code and um, play around with you know that syntax and play around with, with verifying preconditions and post conditions and stuff. It's an open source project, which is good, um, like a real open source project. And uh, it's the syntax is actually very C-like, so it's actually a very high level language. You can see here it pretty much looks very C-like. Um, the only difference is that we have pre and post conditions specified on the method itself. So that's that's kind of what Boogie looks like. And now theorem provers. Uh, there are a bunch of theorem provers out there. Simplify, CVC, Isabel, some of which you might have heard of if you've done verification before. Boogie uses Z3, and so we use Z3. It's also a Microsoft research project that was actually recently open sourced, I think, last month. So how does a theorem prover work? Well, Z3 specifically actually uses a Lisp-like syntax. In fact, it's pretty much Lisp. To express logical statements, so it's going to convert that high-level C code into a Lisp X expression, and then assert that as a statement. We make, basically assert a bunch of statements, and then some magic happens in the theorem prover. It's verifying that all the expressions that we've asserted are, um, do not contradict one another and are consistent. And if it can prove that, then it can tell us that our equation is satisfiable. If it can't, then it tells us it's not. And there is a case where it can tell us it can't do anything. In that case, it says unknown. So that's a theorem prover. So the, I skipped over a dirty little secret before, and that is that we use type annotations. Type annotations are required in Ruby ESC right now. It's kind of a necessity. Uh, the good news is that most of it is an implementation detail. We can get rid of a lot of typing with uh, type inference. And uh, we don't actually support it yet, but that's, that's possible. 
Uh, you can't get rid of all type annotations. It is static analysis, so we do need to tell the our tooling what it is they're op we're operating on. So speaking of annotations, I just want to plug Yard once, one more time. Um, you can grab Yard at yard.org. We we use Yard to annotate all the types and contracts as you saw up there. If the good thing about this is if you have method documentation that you've already marked up with types, you are good to go except for the contract part, which is arguably the harder part, but you're halfway there. Stuff ends my plug. One more sunrise sunset question for you. Look, think about that one, whether you think that's a sunrise or a sunset, it's a little easier. I'll give you a little hint, it's all about context. So moving on. Ruby to Boogie translation. So I mentioned we're translating Ruby into Boogie, and then Boogie's taking that and doing its own thing with it. Let's talk about how we translate Ruby into Boogie. The first thing we do is we translate method control flow. And that's sort of like basically translating Ruby syntax into Boogie syntax. And that's mostly fairly simple. Ruby, Ruby has a fairly, well, we, we know Ruby has a high-level language, but Boogie also has a fairly high-level syntax. We can map it fairly equivalently. So the only difference here is that we have a procedure call instead of a def, and we have to pass in self as an argument because there is no self or this keyword in Boogie. Boogie that has no concept of object orientation. Uh, and the only difference is really the way we return values. The second thing we do is we map the object system. So Boogie, as I mentioned just now, has a different kind of object system than, than, than Ruby does. So we have to define a reference type called value that references all objects. Uh, we use the, the name value because that's what the, the MRI C Ruby implementation, if you've ever looked at the C code, that's, what, that's the name for all the value references. The good thing here is that everything's an object in Ruby, so pretty much all variables are passed in as values. The problem is that Boogie actually requires native types at some point. Uh, at some point, we're operating on some kind of scalar types. Typically, everything in computing ends up narrowing down to some kind of integer mathematics, so the int value is pretty much the most important one. So we actually make a special exception for integers, and we actually alias int and value as the same type. So an integer is a value, and a value is an integer. We can get away with this because, luckily, it's actually the same trick that CRuby does to implement in fixed nums and, and objects. So uh, we actually partition the object space into integers and, and object references. So values, integers, same thing. The next thing we do is we map method calls to procedures. This is the hard step. This is where we have to perform static analysis. We have to resolve the method at translation time, which means we need to know the type of the receiver that we're calling the method on. Once we can figure out the type of the receiver, which if we have annotations, it's pretty easy, um, we have to perform Ruby's method lookup dispatch kind of code that it does in the interpreter, which is looking up the inheritance chain and as well as mixins. So that is one of the harder steps. We then have to handle lambdas and blocks. So the way we do this is we convert lambda blocks into anonymous boogie procedures and we call them as if they were anonymous procedures. Uh, the only problem here is that we have to infer extra contracts. I will point this out in a bit, but every time you have a different method in boogie, it has to have, it have its own contracts. So we have to infer some contracts for the, for the block itself and pull that out into a separate method. The next thing we do is we handle loops. And this is where it gets crazy, because Boogie needs invariance to find all these structures. And that means we, as programmers, have to find them, because it is a fairly manual process. An invariant, if you haven't heard of it before, is basically an expression that holds true for every single iteration of the loop. So for every loop, x is always going to be 2 for that, for that loop. And that's an invariant. There's actually a lot of research going on right now in terms of invariant inference for looping in, in extended static checking, specifically because it's very difficult to write your own invariant uh, for a loop. It's not, it's not trivial. And uh, that is how we do loops in, in short. Um, the last step 
that we have to handle is our is what I call preamble, which is where we define specification for built-in methods. So by default, Ruby does not have specifications built in for you know fixed on plus and, uh, and uh, all the other operators that we would need. So we, we have to manually define those specifications. There's there's good precedent here. We can use Ruby spec and we can use tests and stuff to build those, but it's still a manual process, so it takes quite a bit of time. So that's um, that's mostly an overview of how we do Ruby to Boogie translation. To summarize, we map control flow, we map the object type system, we map method dispatch to procedure calls, and uh, do static analysis for that. We handle the lambdas to turn them into anonymous methods, and uh, as well as loops. And then we have to create the preamble and create a base set of uh, specifications for the buildings. So what are some issues and limitations of Ruby ESC? Working backwards, the standard library is not fully covered. As I mentioned, it's a manual process. It takes a long time and a lot of effort to implement specifications for all the methods inside of Ruby. Um, we currently focus on integers and arrays, mostly because that's the kind of stuff we're doing with the group concept. So we don't really cover strings that well, but we could theoretically cover them. Methods with multiple type signatures. So you can have a method that takes an array and sometimes and strings some other times. In Ruby DSC in our current implementation, we don't actually support that. There are ways to work around this though. One of them would be, this is actually a typing problem. This is really just a typing problem. With better type inference, we could actually solve this problem quite easily. Uh, the other way we can handle this is by having separate overloads. And if you do document your methods with multiple overloads and have a specification for each one, that's another way to do it. Then there's eval. So eval is really dynamic stuff that's happening at one time that we cannot figure out statically. There's pretty much no way to go around this except for annotations. Um, so we're pretty much stuck on that front. It's obviously not ideal, but pretty much uh, if, you have, if you have some dynamic code so running using eval, you would have to have some kind of annotation that specifies what this eval does. Fortunately, we try to keep eval light, so it's easy to find those hot spots and, and you know, you know write those out if you really need the ESC. Do you know Max? They've got the Apple icon up here. But I think the bigger problem here is that your entire store base needs contracts for this model number. And that's a real big issue. Because contracts are not that easy to write. We saw the Fibonacci sequence, that was easy, but that was also an easy method. Um, for a, met a 10 line method that does a bunch of different logical steps and integrates with different systems, it becomes way more difficult. And this is generally an ESC problem. It's not a problem of our tool necessarily, but it's, it's mostly an extended static checking problem. The fact that you really get an all or nothing uh, behavior. If you don't, if you're missing one contract in your entire uh, in your entire program, your entire program will not uh, be able to be tested. So it's not perfect. Ruby, uh, Ruby ESC is not perfect, but fortunately, we have symbolic execution. Symbolic execution is not perfect either, but it does give us some benefits that Ruby ESC doesn't give us. The biggest one is that it does not require contracts at all. Um, it can use them, but it does not require them. That means that if you have a program and you're missing one contract somewhere, you will still be able to test your, your, your program. So you don't have that all or nothing problem that, Ruby, that ESC does. So let's run through an example of what symbolic execution might actually look like if we were to actually execute our code. So just to summarize, symbolic execution is really just what it sounds like, where we are executing a block of Ruby code symbolically. So instead of concrete status, scalar values, we substitute everything with a symbolic value. And we, um, we resolve those values after we execute our code. So if we were to run through this method, we would start with y equals 5x. Five, five so we assign 5 times x to y, so that would turn y into 5x. We then branch. So when symbolic execution hits a branch, it takes both branches automatically and resolves a separate uh, symbolic value for each branch as a separate state. So we split off our branch into one state, and we now have 5x plus 2. We then split off our branch into a second state, and we have 5x divided by x, 
missed the assignment there on the, on the left side of the Um So we actually end up with two states now and at the end, and we return both of those states. So we now have two output states. The end result of symbolic execution is basically a set of states for each code path, for each branch, and for each loop. We have a set of different states. Each state has a set of logical formulas, like y equals 5x or y equals 5x over x. We then can run these uh, logical formulas through a theorem prover to discover when they are unsatisfiable. Uh, and our logical theorem, our, our theorem prover would actually be able to figure out, for instance, for 5x divided by x, when x is 0, we know that that is unsatisfiable. And our, our theorem prover is able to tell us that. So how is this really different from ESC? We're converting them both into logical formulas and passing them to theorem provers. This doesn't really seem all that different. The real difference here is that ESC requires us to know what our result will be beforehand. We need to, it basically, assume, it basically uh, verifies that our assertions about our code are correct. The difference is that symbolic execution allows us to discover what our result will be, not having known what the specification is. So how is this related to automated testing? And more importantly, how is symbolic execution different from unit testing? Why would I just unit testing? So symbolic execution and unit testing are a little different. The difference is that unit testing really only confirms what we've asked it to check. If we say, you know, check Fibonacci when n, when n is 2, and you should get whatever the result is, you're only checking for that value. Symbolic execution actually doesn't use any symbolic concrete values on the first pass. So it can really run through and check all the values. It can resolve a bunch of values and, and figure out either using heuristics or just logic to figure out there are certain values that this function will not work on. In other words, it's automatically generating test cases for us. So it's able to figure out scenarios where our program will succeed or fail. So now it's time for another demo, this time of Ruby case gen, and I'll drop back into the terminal here. And this time we will run the Fibonacci sequence, uh, Fibonacci sequence through the case generation tool. And we will see what it generates. So it's going to take a bit of time, but when it comes back, it should give us a set of tests. So it generated a bunch of tests for us. Let me just... So we have a bunch of tests, starting from n equals 0, n equals 2, you notice that it skipped n equals 1 because it was able to detect that n is n, 1 and 2 are the same case. It then went to 3 and 4. It, went, it would have kept going to 5, 6, 7, 8, um, but the loop, bound in, the loop bound in the symbolic execution engine was exhausted, so the, the symbolic execution engine will basically keep trying until it runs out of stack space, or you can, you can define how long it's going to check, how, how many loop iterations it can check for, or you know, how, how long it's going to rehearse. But in this case, we have a recursion step of about three or four. So it stops at four, um, and it's able to generate these test cases for us. Um, so we can actually run these tests through. Um, you can see that our test pass. So that's Ruby case gen. So how does Ruby case gen work? Well, we actually translate type annotated Ruby into Myra. And some of you have heard of Myra before, but I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit. We then use TSN as our symbolic execution engine. TSN, uh, we'll also talk about it in just a second. Our symbolic execution basically, as I just described, will resolve all the values in our, symbol, in our symbolic, all of our symbolic values into concrete values depending on heuristics as well as the case, as well as uh, whether or not uh, our, the theorem logic actually says that there's a case here that will fail or, or, or might pass in a, in a different way than the others. So we end up with test cases generated as data, and then the only thing we have left to do is really convert them into executable Ruby unit test code. So Myra is a statically typed Ruby-like language. It was created by Charlie Nutter 
who is the JRuby guy, if everybody knows him here. Um, it basically compiles Ruby into straight Java code. So we have it converts it converts to type. The difference is the only difference between Ruby and MyWrite is really the fact that there's type annotations on methods. Everything else is done with type inference. So we actually do get type inference for Ruby case gen. Um, so, so that's my run. PSN is part of the Serum framework, and Serum is just a, a framework for that verification using Java. And uh, it's created by the Santos Lab at Kansas State University, and it's open source. And that's the symbolic execution engine that we're using. So you might be thinking now, we're testing Java code. Wait, what? Um, the answer is only kind of. We're sort of testing Java code. At the end of the day, we're still writing Ruby code at the top. I mean, for Ruby ESC, we convert we convert Ruby into boogie code, so we're not really testing Ruby code. But we use Java code in this in Ruby case gen to generate our static code. So how does PSN know which values to use? That's another question that, that might be useful. So here's another sunrise sunset question. This one, you, this time you get a better hint. That's east. So now it should be fairly obvious what what it is. So as I mentioned, it's all about context, right? If we provide type annotations to PSN, it knows what types to operate on. That's step one. We can then provide optional contracts to tell PSN exactly what boundaries we want to test it. So we have extra context for PSN to actually figure out, you know, should I test negative one on a Fibonacci sequence? Does that even make sense? So we can specify optional constraints. For instance, if we had a progress bar that really only makes sense between zero and 100, we can specify these preconditions and tell PSN, you know, don't test this between negative F below zero or above 100, it's not going to make sense. But I still didn't answer the real question here that you all came for. Could a machine ever write tests for our code? The answer is kind of simple, we just saw it, yes. So we just saw Ruby case gen generating test cases for our code. The only problem is it's the wrong question, right? The better question is, Will automatic test case generation always work for us? Should we just adopt this feature and start writing, you know, using some block execution all the time in our tests and our Rails code? The answer for that is not always, right? There are some scenarios where we just cannot handle certain features of Ruby where they're way too demanding for us. And so that brings us into limitations. So one of the limitations of Ruby case gen is that we do convert Ruby into Java using Myra. We can therefore only support what Myra supports, and Myra does not have full coverage of Ruby. It's only a Ruby-like language, it's not a Ruby language. Java also doesn't work exactly like Ruby. Um, integer values don't work the same way. Um, there are other differences, minor differences. Fortunately for us, most of the differences are fairly minor. It's actually surprising how close they match. Um, the other issue, and the bigger issue, is that we still don't properly handle the valid code. And we still have to rely on annotations for this kind of stuff. Annotations are good, but it's not really how we want to have to write Ruby code. And at the end of the day, there are things that we just will need to annotate that are way too dynamic for a static analysis tool to handle. So how can we improve a Ruby case gen version 2 if we were to do that? There are a couple of things we can do to make Ruby case gen more effective. The first thing we can do is teach KSN to symbolically execute Ruby code. So currently, KSN really only understands Java, and that's sort of why we took the shortcut through Myra. If we had access to VM instructions in Ruby 2, or currently, uh, the Ruby 1.9 interpreter doesn't really give you access to the bytecode or the VM at, at a very low level. If we had access to that kind of stuff, it would be much easier to write in it, to write a symbolic executor, because really what you're doing in a symbolic execution engine is effectively uh, running the bytecode at a byte level. That's really where we want to be. So if we had that kind of access, it would definitely make it easier for us to write a um, PSM interpreter for that. 
The other thing we could do is implement Ruby abstractions in Myra. So we, instead of uh, making make instead of making Kiosan understand Ruby, we can make Myra understand Ruby. And currently, as I mentioned, Myra really just compiles your Ruby down to Java code. So if you're using a string in Ruby, you're going to get a string in java.lang, a string of native string type. We can build abstractions on top of that and pull them in into Myra and have Myra compile us compile us a, a, a program that uses Ruby abstractions from Ruby standard library. And at that point, we can actually have better matching to Ruby and uh, Ruby's features. We can also forget about TSN entirely and write our own symbolic execution engine. There have there has been some work done in static analysis with Ruby in terms of writing intermediate representation languages. So Laser is a good one of that, a good example of that. But writing a symbolic execution engine is pretty tough. So that's, that's a pretty tough uh, path to go down. Finally, there's LLVM Clee. Clee is a, a, another symbolic execution engine that runs on top of LLVM bytecode. It interprets LLVM bytecode and has, executes that. So we have an LLVM implementation of Ruby called Rubinius. And actually, Rubinius would be a very good place to try out this kind of thing. I, these are the ideas that I came up with as, as future steps for the, for the project. I'm open to ideas. I, I'm, I'm sure I didn't think of everything. If you just thought of something now, if you've been thinking about this for a while, um, please come up to me and we can talk. I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to hear about how we can do, do things better for that. There's some more details here. If you really want to know about exactly how uh, we translate Ruby into Boogie and what, what are all the real technical issues we deal, deal with in terms of lambdas and looping and all those crazy things, you can actually read. I have two papers published on that subject, so you can grab those. I can throw in Google Scholar over them. And with that, I want to thank you guys. Instead of uh, instead of Rubinius first, 
So uh, we were, I was actually working with, with Serum as a, at, for, research, for other research issues. So I mean, we were, we were actually using Serum in general for, for the project. Um, so that was sort of the, the guiding principle that I knew more about the Serum framework than I did about LPM Lee. Uh, I had seen demos on Klee, and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how, uh, how it stands up to to Kiesan. Kiesan does have specific optimizations that, that makes the block execution like way more possible. And I don't know if it really has those things. So those are, those are things we have to investigate. Um, that was really the, the, the bigger issue. I think we mostly had a Java stack behind us, so it was, it was easier to find. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much, guys. <laughs>